Mr. Champ, can I understand you're going to afford to Yes, I need them. Can't you need anybody? Well, we need them. And we're taking five with all this time, but of course, we can't take any more. You see, all I'm in are trained men. So I understand the sound camera, understand the whole art of photography. And you see, it's the first time we ever took anyone on our trips. We do make the colors, too. Yes, we're going to get colors, we're going to get everything. Yeah. Well, Mrs. Johnson, I... Mrs. Johnson, how do you get along with the natives? Well, I speak their language, which is Swahili. And uh, I really like the African natives. We've always found them very loyal. You yeah. have? Well, how about the food, Mrs. Johnson? I suppose you get a lot of wild game out there, don't you? Oh, yes. We have many uh, varieties of partridge, guinea hen, and uh, venison, and all kinds of delicious meat. Oh, you have? What a country, and a butcher bill. All righty, folks. Let's go. Now, instead of trying to answer all your questions, we will take you to the world and attempt to show you what happened and explain as we go along. I shall just take your seat. Don't get in front of the projector. <laughs> Darling, you're going to run three reels or five? I'm going to run nine. Really? Yeah, I'm going to show all the South Seas and Africa and show the lands. In Tanganyika? Yes. Oh, that's great. That'll be wonderful. Yeah, that's going to be fine. While many of our most thrilling experiences have happened in Africa, other unforgettable days were spent in the South Pacific Islands. They are beautiful islands, but in some of the group, the savages are cannibalistic as they were thousands of years ago. And it may interest you to know that on the map, the South Pacific covers one-seventh of the entire Earth's surface. Now, we first tell you, starting here at San Francisco, going to Hawaii, come to Samoa, and across to Sydney, Australia. Then we went up to the Solomon Islands. And here in the Solomon, at Tulagi, the seat of government, we were able to about 100 soldiers through the courtesy of the resident government officials. These soldiers went along with us as guards. It would have been suicide to go without such protection. Yes, it was almost suicide going uh, with them. I'll say it was. Now, Osi, if you will uh, go turn out the light. Yes, sir. And uh, perhaps if you turn on the radio, it will, perhaps the music will lull the pictures. <laughs> a part of the standing army of the Solomons. We have just received word that our friend, who trained these men, was killed and eaten here only a few months ago. And we know of several other people who have been killed since then. I believe it will be at least a hundred years before the Solomon Islands are entirely civilized, and perhaps not then. When we first arrived here, O.C. naturally, just coming out of civilization, didn't think very much of these savages. Of course, I had seen them before, and I knew what to expect. I knew that they were cannibals, and I knew that they were headhunters. At the same time, I had sort of a feeling uh, of, res well, I wouldn't say respect, but sometimes I like the people, because they really are just a bunch of children. They're childlike. and. Uh, uh, really happy at times, although, of course, they are as cannibalistic as any people in the world. They have all kinds of peculiar ornaments in their noses and their ears, and some of them show that they've been in fights, although the cannibal is really never a hard fighter. He's uh, a coward. Now, while we were here, we made arrangements with Mr. Markham, a trader, to use his schooner for trips into the outlying parts of the group. Now, the woman that you see in the picture, she's not a convict, although she is serving a life sentence. That's my wife, that's Lucy. Well, we had a wonderful time sailing through these islands. After about 200 miles from Tulagi, we came to a small group that is known as Langa Lagoon. Here, there are about 100 manufactured islands. I think they're the most interesting islands I've ever seen because they are composed of people who have been run off the larger islands in fights 
and because they had no place else to go, they would go out on the reefs and pick up stones and corals and shells and manufacture new islands. None of these islands are very large. Most generally, you can walk around them in 10 or 15 minutes. And the people here live their entire lives on coconut and fish, never tasting anything else, unless it might be that after a few years they become friendly with the people on the mainland again. And then, of course, in that case, they would be allowed to uh, go ashore and trade because the mainland people naturally want fish. And the people who live on the mainland, naturally they can't go out on the salt water or the people on the artificial islands would kill them. So sometimes they do form sort of a truce. Here's a boy getting coconut for his lunch, perhaps. Notice the starfish in the bottom. You can see the clear, how clear the water is. These boys, when they go in after the starfish for Osi, of course, Osi, she wanted to bring all of these things back with her. Why, they never go in head first. They always go in feet first. And they've got to be very careful the way they pick up the starfish. Because if they're not careful, the tentacle will close on their hands and form a very ugly, painful wound. Now, most of the fish that these people eat are very tiny. So small that they're much smaller than white bait. Millions and millions and millions of them can be seen in these canoes. And when the fish are eaten, they're dried, they're not cooked. They're placed in bags, and the bags are placed along the edge of the island. See them here on this picture? And I'll tell you, no one wants to go along the windward side of this island after the fish have been placed up there. Now, from the artificial islands, we sailed on to the coast of Malaita. I think that this was one of the happiest times of our South Sea Island experiences. We sailed up this coast of this savage island. We then went ashore and made a permanent camp. But before going ashore, we would see smoke arising all along the coast from the villages telling one another that we were coming. Here you see a head house and also a canoe house in one. You see, they keep all the skulls of their enemies. The canoes that these people use are the best I have seen in the South Pacific. They are inlaid with mother of pearl, and they are really very staunch vessels, although perhaps this would not look to be very staunch to you, but these people will sometimes make raids a hundred miles away from their own home, making raids on other tribes. Now this picture shows a real war canoe. You know, sometimes you get used to seeing pictures of canoes with savages, and people call them war canoes when they're not. But this picture does show a real war canoe. Of the Luanua Lagoon is tattooed. Every inch of the body is tattooed. But of course, these pictures do not pick it up very well because the pigment is almost exactly the same color as the skin of the natives. Here's the Devil Devil House. Inside the Devil Devil House are to be found the devil. Here you see Tyler. Now Tyler is a chief of the Devil Devil Men, and he's a dandy old fella. And if he's a representative of the devil, the devil must be a pretty nice fella because Tyler was. We liked him very much. This is Tyler's son. Notice that head of hair, naturally curly. Any woman in the world would be proud to have this head of hair, especially now in the days of short hair. This is Tyler's home, and also the home of the other Devil Devil men. It's uh, set in the deep coconut groves, quite a distance from the rest of the village. And here are the eight Devil Devil men. Now, while we were here, they had one of their devil devil ceremonies. Before it started, wreaths were placed in front of every house to keep the devil devils from getting inside. Then the devils were taken out of the houses and taken down to the beach and allowed to look at the ocean. After which, they were carried through the village. I don't know the exact purpose of this, 
but I think probably for sort of a tour of inspection. It's interesting to note that there's not a piece of wood on any of these islands as large as the devils. And the devils are now very old. They must have been much larger at one time. Uh, we don't know where the trees could have come from. Uh, that is where they got the wood to have carved these big devil devils. Now, after they'd gone through their tour of inspection, they were placed in front of the devil devil house and left there for one week. During this time, conch shells were blown day and night. Also a part of their ceremony that we never exactly understood. Then the girls were taken out and marched through the villages. These girls were also marched in front of the devil devils. They were covered with a, uh, uh, an oil made of coconut oil. And the devil devils would say or tell the devil devil men in some language, we never knew exactly how it was done, whether the girls could be married or not. I notice this girl is being stopped and the devil devil men scrape some of the coconut oil off her back. And they place this oil in front of these wooden images. And then the wooden images, by some means, say whether the girls can be married during the following year. Now they're bringing in the coconuts from the sacred coconut island. This is sort of a holy week. During this week, the natives must eat only coconuts from this one island. The coconuts are piled up on the beach and counted and then allotted to the different families who take them back to their houses. The festivities conclude with a dance. I want you to notice how serious these people are. They do everything seriously. You see, what they're trying to do is to keep the devil in good humor. And by the way, these people do not have a good God. They only have devils. Their idea is, if they can keep the devils in good humor, well, everything's going to be all right. And so what is the use of having a good God? This dance started late in the evening, and in the morning when we awoke, it was still going on. While we were here, one of the natives died and he was buried in a very small grave. After the grave was covered over, one of the devil devil men came up with a coconut leaf and placed it over the grave. And then he made another wreath. Uh, now these people seem to have a great respect for a wreath uh, placed over. The cemetery here is extremely interesting for one reason is almost as white as sugar. And here we saw an interesting ceremony. Whenever one of the Luanua people die, one member of the family must mourn over the grave for a period of from six months to 10 years. The time is allotted by the uh, devil devil uh, men. I don't know just how they fix this time. Here's one of the mourners. He cannot leave here. He cannot go home to eat or sleep. He must stay here during the entire time that he must mourn over this grave. To the Solomon Islands, there we secured fresh supplies and returned to the island of Malakula and then continued our way on down to the New Herbides Island. Now we'd heard of an island down here where the people were headhunted on the island of Malakula. And we wanted to find out if such a thing as headhunting really did exist. And so we made the trip. We had to go about uh, 1,700 miles before we reached Malakula. Do you remember when we were married and Martin took me down to that awful country? And uh, it was our first trip, really our honeymoon trip. I'll never forget it. And you know, we had so many hardships that I just felt that if we ever got back alive, that all I'd want would be a real home. And so far, all that Martin has given me has been a mud hut in the South Seas and uh, a tent in Africa. <laughs> O.C. and I agreed that our South Sea Island sailing was among the happiest days of our life. Just to sail along day by day without any worries of any kind. 
Oh, it was wonderful. Sometimes we did run into storms. During these times, we would have to lash Osi to the deck so that she would not be washed overboard. Then we would sail up along the little islands and see the natives along the shore. Sometimes small boats would put out to us. Then after several weeks, we landed on the small island of Bao in the New Hades, a little island only two and a half miles across. Here the people were just as cannibalistic and savage as any place in the South Seas. But we were safe because they knew that if they harmed us, that the British man of war could get to them. They resented our presence here, but of course it didn't make any difference. We did as we pleased. Now, during the time that we were here, we saw a very interesting ceremony, also uh, one that we did not like to see. But it was so interesting that we photographed it. We saw on three different occasions when they buried their old men alive. When men reach the age of 80 or 90, they are placed in the hole. The ground is placed over their bodies, and they are actually buried alive with men dancing inside the grave. It takes two days and two nights for this ceremony to be completed. Now here you see the savage island of Malakula off in the distance, just a few miles away. We heard of a chief here, Chief Nagapath, who was one of the most interesting types in the South Seas. We wanted to see him, although we had been warned not to land on this big island. We secured a small whale boat and a crew of six savages from our small island of Bow. What a fine crew to go out with. Yes, I'll admit that they were not a very fine looking crew, but they really were good sailors. Here we'll give you an idea of our route to the big numbers country. You see our small island of Bow. Then you will notice where we landed to secure our guides. Then we went on around in big numbers country and landed there. And you will notice our route on back into the hills. Here are our three guides that we picked up for this trip. We afterwards found that they were very treacherous. Now, in order to give you an idea of the things that happened to us afterwards, I would like to show you some of the jungle of this country. It's so dense that it's almost impossible for anyone to go inland unless they follow a trail. And by watching this picture closely, it will give you an idea of what Osi and I had to go through the night that we were captured by the headhunters. Now, we landed several places along this coast. We would see interesting villages. And in one place, we found the people were what Osi called monkey people, because these people lived and spent almost their entire lives up in the trees. They had no villages and no gardens of any kind. They simply climbed like monkeys. Notice the toes on this man caused by climbing these trees. You see, the savages living all around this small tribe were continually at war, and they had destroyed the houses and destroyed the gardens of these people perhaps centuries ago. And so now the poor people did not have enough courage to build houses Again. This boy is eating clay. Of course, these people have periods of famine when they cannot get enough food, and so they try to fill up their stomachs with this clay. It will digest all right, but naturally it don't taste very good. As we would go along this island, we would see natives watching us, and sometimes we would land and talk with them. All of them had old Snyder rifles. Some of them were marked Tower of London, 1854. They were traded to them by the unscrupulous traders. Of course, it's against the law, but they were traded to them, and every time one of those guns was shot, it meant the death of a white man. Weren't you frightened, Mrs. Johnson? Yes, I was, but I didn't dare let them know it. Of course, we did have some sort of protection. The boys who were still in our boat had their guns trained on these savages. And when we went back into the uh, interior shortways, our boys were still guarding us. 
Now, this old man, who was perhaps 90, knew he was about to die, and he was praying before his own private devil-devil. The poor old fellow was frightened when I tried to make pictures of him. He didn't know what was happening. He probably thought we were going to shoot him. Now, here's the inside of a head house. Notice up along the rafters the dried human heads. And you will notice some figures inside, mummified figures. We estimated that there were over 150 of the dried human heads in this one particular head house. Now, here is the keeper of this head house. We persuaded him to take some of his images and dried heads outside so that we could photograph them better. These images are skeletons over which has been placed clay and then dried. These human heads are real human heads. All of these people along this coast are headhunters. They uh, kill their enemies and save the heads and cure them. No, this man's not talking or into a microphone. He's uh, playing a little dirge to his uh, own favorite head. These people have a very interesting way in curing these heads. They will first place them in salt water and then place them over the fire and smoke them, very much the same as we would a ham. Uh, they have to do this about every three or four months or the heads will spoil. This man was very proud of his art. He told me that he was the best head dryer in all of the South Sea Islands. He said that there was no one who could approach his art in this work. The head that this man is now drying was really quite fresh when we first saw it. This man brought me several human heads, wanted me to buy them, but I didn't like their looks and so I bought none of them. Then it's taken off and it leaves the head of the child very long. Mrs. Johnson didn't like this job, but I wanted to show the baby from different angles in order to get an idea of just how long they bind these heads. Now I'm going to them anyway. As a matter of fact, they haven't any intelligence to start with. Although up to the time that these people die, their heads are always long. Some of these old people here were quite good natured. Mrs. Johnson called this fellow Santa Claus. Now from here we kept on sailing until we reached Big Number Bay, our objective and the place that we had wanted to see for many years. As we came up to the beach, there were only a few savages there. One of them, who could speak a little bit of the mere English, came to Mrs. Johnson and said, Belly, belong me, he walk about too much, which meant he had the stomach ache. And so I went back to the boat, and out of the medicine chest, I secured a bottle of cascara pills. And I poured out a handful and told him to take one each time the sun went on, but he made a mistake and he didn't understand me and took the whole bunch at one time. Now, while we were here on the beach, some of the natives were eating meat. Mrs. Johnson didn't like this very well because she said it might be human flesh. I gave some of the natives cigarettes to smoke. Some of them knew what they were for, others didn't. One tried to eat the cigarette. He thought it was food. Then we received word that Nipat, their chief, was coming down to see us. And out of the bush, there came the finest specimen of a savage that we had ever seen. He and his bodyguard and some of his children. Nagapat had the most powerful face I've ever seen on a savage. There was not a blemish on his body. His eyes looked just like the eyes of a wild animal. You could hardly see the pupils. They were so uh, bloodshot. In his teeth, these belts are uh, what uh, they use to bind up the stomach when they're hungry. Notice this fellow here. He looks like there ever was a cross between the ape and man. It must have been this fellow. As I was telling you about these belts, these people do not know how to conserve food. This is stop up the nostrils to such an extent that when they breathe, they sound like a peanut stand, whistling. Now we decided to give these people a picture show. In fact, we had brought along with us 
a complete electrical equipment and a projector. And that night, we set up the screen and got everything ready. And I showed them five reels of moving pictures. And it was certainly interesting to watch their faces. You know, I told you, Martin took me down to this awful country on our honeymoon. Now I know why he did it. He knew that I wouldn't leave him among all these awful people. You see, these savages were so happy, and we were so interested in watching them, that we forgot to be afraid. We did not know how to until the next day. Here's Mrs. Johnson and Nagapat. Next morning, they went up to the screen and tried to find out what had become of the picture that they did before. I forgot to tell you, this here, we had already made arrangements for them before we left Fowl. They had 15 black sailors, all of them armed. And with these two friends and the sailors, we set out for the interior of Malakula. We wanted to see Nagapat's village and see more of his people. We also wanted to see the women, but they kept the women out of sight. For the first four miles, it was fairly easy going, and everything looked bright and cheerful. It was a wonderful day. Birds were singing out in the trees, and really there was nothing to be afraid of until we commenced to see skulls all over the trail. And then we commenced to get a little back. And I thought it when I saw these faces, hundreds of them peeking at us from out of hill. Finally, one of the natives to make a peculiar loud cry. He called Nagapat, and when Nagapat appeared, he stood there staring at us. His people stood there, cheerful, happy, bunch of people that we had showed the pictures to the night before. I don't mind telling you that both Ozzy and I were frightened. One of them came up to me and commenced to feel my arm. Probably he wanted to find out if I would be good to eat. At least that's the way it seemed to me at that time. Then, Nagapat gave some orders while watching us, and we were taken back just a short distance to his gully. Here, we wanted to run. We wanted to get away. We were so frightened we hardly knew what we were doing because there were thousands of people here by this time. Way back in the bush, we could see these cruel faces watching us. The people commenced to dance, and they beat on their devil devils. They made so much noise, we could not understand the words that they were saying. But all the time, the people were watching us, and all the time, I was making pictures. I was trying my best to keep from looking as though I was afraid. And of course, all the time, I wanted to get away. Megapat and his chief stood around and made remarks that we could not understand. But we felt that these remarks were about us. And the other people stood around, talking among each other, but always turning their faces towards us. Then Megapat and his chief got up, and they commenced to do a dance. And then all the people joined in the dance. And all the time, they were watching us. They had supercilious laughs on their faces. And we knew that we were in for trouble. And we were just figuring what we might do, how we might get away from here. I packed up. Well, there's the reason. I'm sorry I can't show you more of this, but right here they see that. And while one group dragged me and the sailors off into the hills in one direction, Megapath and another group dragged Ozzy off another sail until I lost track of her. I had revolvers in my hip pocket, but I did not dare use them. We were so quickly outnumbered. But I had just about decided to make a big for it and shoot my way to Ozzy. When I heard those savages speak the first word of English that I had heard, it was man of war. They released me, and I made a base to find Ozzy, whom I located off on a nearby trail, frightened and with a dislocated wrist. We looked down to the water far below, and there saw the government boat. We learned afterwards that the governor, Mr. King, Hearing that we were on Malakula, the king worried and started out to find us. Despite the peaceful, 
was probably the only thing in the world to frighten these terrible people. A year or two before, in order to quell an uprising among which was armed, had uh, killed these people in the hills, killed their villages, and killed a great many of them. Very short, the cannibals fled. Arriving at Alexandra in northern Egypt, we went up to Cairo, then continued on up to Khartoum, and then on up the Nile to Rejab, then across the Congo to the place where we photographed the pygmies, then the white rhino, then on the Ave, Lake Albert, then to the Victoria Nile, then down to Nairobi, and then down into the lion country in Tanganyika. Khartoum we were joined by Mr. George Eastman and Al Kaiser, Dr. Al Kaiser. There were just the four of us on board this little boat, the Dow. The first six or seven or eight days from Khartoum, we were going through just ordinary Egyptian scenery. There's Mr. Eastman and Osi and Dr. Kaiser. And then we came into the Sud country. This sud is nothing but a mass of papyrus and tiger grass. Hundreds of thousands of square miles of nothing but this grass. There's no animals here and very few birds and no natives. It might interest you to know that scientists have now discovered a means of making a spirit from this swamp grass that will take the place of gasoline when gasoline is all gone. From the sud, we continued on up the Nile until we came into the country of the Dinkus tribe, a very degenerate tribe, one of the lowest types of people in Africa and most uninteresting. They had no gardens, they did nothing of any interest, and we, when we passed through them and came to the small settlement of Rejab, where I photographed a few of the types of people. This girl has a new type of a lipstick. It's made out of glass. Here we would see the girls go in and wash their bodies in the Nile and then take their water bottles up and get water that they would take back to drink in their camp. We continued on until we arrived at Ye, a sleeping sickness headquarter. Here we saw them examining the natives' horses. It may interest you to know that sleeping sickness is now a 100% cure if it's caught in time. This man is a victim of sleeping sickness in its advanced stage. We then took Mr. Eastman back as far as Rejaf, and he continued back to Khartoum on the Dell, while Osi and I went back into the Congo Here's our safari. These boxes contain food, ammunition, photographic material, tents, and such things as that. When we arrived in the north end of the Atura forest, we found that we had a large safari of women going along with us as well as our porters. And here we first saw the little pygmy people. At first, these people were very shy. I don't think that they were exactly afraid of us, but they were afraid of our camera. They probably thought that they were some new sort that might go off almost any moment. You have perhaps noticed that Osi is very small, much smaller than the average woman. It will give you an idea of the size of these pygmy people by comparing these pygmy women with her. You will notice the clothing that these two women are wearing. Well, that's not their clothing at all. It belongs to me. You see, these people don't wear any clothing, and so I had to dress them in order that I could make pictures that I could show you. Now this picture of me and two full-grown pygmy men will perhaps give you a better idea of their size. You will notice that the little man on my right has only one eye. I think uh, he must have had an accident at some time or another because we found the pygmies to be very free from disease, especially skin diseases. Here it takes two of them to reach to the top of my Graflex camera while I have to lean over, stoop over, in order to look down into the ground glass. 
I've turned on the light in this flashlight so they can see it. But it's daytime, and of course they cannot see it very well. But that night, I turned on the light in the forest, and they could see it way back among the trees, and they thought it was wonderful. And in the next two or three nights, they burned out every battery I had. As you will notice in this picture, I would perhaps make a very good orchestra leader. Now, their dances don't amount to anything. They simply hop up and down this way for hours at a time. And there's no rhyme nor reason to their dances, and almost no rhythm. I cannot understand why they enjoy these dances, but they must because they will keep up this dance for hours at a time. When I first saw this dance, I thought it might have been the origin of the black bottom. Mrs. Johnson is showing them the first mirror that they have ever seen. Now this man is singing although you would not think so if you could hear him. Actually, the noise that they make when they think they are singing is terrible. These people would come around our camp, and they would beg for everything they would see. They wanted one of my moving picture cameras. It cost me over $5,000. They did not know why they wanted it, but they saw me playing with it every day, and they thought it must be something pretty nice. I gave them some glass jars and some cups and some rice and salt and things of that sort. You see, there's no salt found in the Congo, and they're very glad to get it. Well, one day, I noticed that they were taking very good care of their little chief, feeding him on the rice that I gave them. So I moved up close with my cameras and made this picture. He had five wives waiting on him. Although why any man should want five wives is more than I can understand. But they certainly did give him wonderful service. I know that I never get service like this at home. Well, Martin, there's a reason. You only have one wife. Yes, I suppose there's something in that. Just notice the haircut. It seemed as though every one of these people had a different idea for a haircut. Now I tried to get this little woman to sing for me. And she started out all right. Then she broke into a silly laugh and could not continue her song. This little pygmy chief saw me smoking a cigar, and he wanted one. Well, I gave it to him, and he had a very hard time getting it lit. I am certain that he had never smoked before, and I am also certain that he will never smoke again. After he got it lit, he smoked for a few minutes, and then he commenced to get sick. Then he threw it away in disgust. Just notice how serious the two are in the picture. Notice these two lions playing with this wildebeest kill, just the same as two cats would with a mouse. These lions are in extra good condition. Now notice this fellow is carrying his wildebeest away. You see, he's not very hungry. And he does not want the uh, jackals and hyenas and vultures to get it. And so he's taking the kill away so that he can feed on it whenever he feels hungrier than he does now. Now here's a fine family, four fine big female lioness and two fine males. They start away, and I tell Opie to make an animal sound so as to stop them and so that they will look around and into the camera. Yes, and they make the zebra call, and it, it sounds like this. They all went away. One of them, one of the big males and three young females, 
stayed with the zebra, the big kill for them. And then the big fella came back. But they didn't want him there. And then a fight started. The big fella was chased away, while the others remained with the kill. And then the big fella walked away in disgust. He was trying to seem as though that he had not been licked, but his feelings were certainly hurt. He walked away into the grass and lay down with his feet up in the air. And then when Osi whistled at him, he turned around and looked at us, although he was trying to seem as though he was not self-conscious. Now here's a nice lion sunning itself on a large rock. I threw a piece of wood at it, trying to make it move or stand up. But he was so well fed and so contented that he did not want to move. He seems as though he's panting. I don't think it's very hot here, but it's simply the fact that lions get fire through the mouth and it makes them seem as though they're hot. Now here's an interesting situation. One day, Osi and I were photographing what we thought were four or five or six lions. And then after about five minutes, we noticed that there were others in the grass. And then, in about 10 minutes, we counted and found that there were 28 lions all about us. Of course, we could not photograph them all at one time, because they were in different directions and many of them were laying down in the grass so far that we could only see the tips of their ears. You know, it's an interesting fact that a lion can hide in grass that's only about one foot high. He often does when he's after game. I want you to notice the expressions on these lions, how curious they are. At one time, Mosey and I started to back away and they came fine display of muscles a big, fine beast. I think he might have come for us if we had have, uh, kept after him very long. Notice he's not looking very cheerful. Now here's one of my favorite pictures. It looks as though it was made in a wheat field. The grass is dead about a month after the rains have stopped. It, the picture was made about 6 o'clock in the evening, just before the sun went down. That's the reason why we have this fine studio light on this lion. Now here's a very fine fellow. There's a young female lying in the grass at his feet. It's very seldom that we ever find a lion with as fine a mane as this one. That's because nearly all of the grass and the uh, trees and the shrubs have uh, burrs and uh, salt, and so that they get in the lion's mane. And then the lions will lay down on trees and uh, try to comb them out with their claws, and they leave behind bunches of mane. And for that reason, we never see lions with as fine a mane out in the wild as you do in a zoo. But as I said, this is one of the finest looking lions that we have ever seen. And I'll leave it to you if he is not a beauty. some pepper in a topi kill one day and the lions came up and started to sneeze while they were feeding. You would think that they would leave the kill alone after that, but they seemed to like the pepper. Just notice their silly expression on this lion's face. I rather believe he likes the uh, pepper. Probably good seasoning for him. Now some days when Osi and I feel that we have enough courage, we're going to get up close to lions and get some very close-up pictures. But of course, that's not true. Here are four very fine, healthy lions that object to us being so close to them while they are feeding. And so they try to drag their zebra off into the bush. I just wish you again would notice they play of muscles on these fine big fellows. Always when the vultures smell a kill, they hover around in the sky until the lion goes away. And then they swoop down on the kill. Sometimes they feed until they can scarcely move. They're so full. And then in a few minutes come the hyena. We don't like the hyena because he's a slinking, sly, absolute disgusting animal. The boy and I got so tired of Martin photographing all the uh, lions in Africa. So one day, Dick and I decided to have a golf game. 
Now, isn't this just like a woman for you? Stops right in the middle of an important golf game to powder her nose. Teddy. What was the trouble with him, anyhow? Well, uh, what's the trouble with yours? Oh, I think Mike Teddy was sort of high hat. Oh. He had an, he looked nice in that big silk hat of his, but he was the dumbest fellow I ever saw in all of our sea down there in Africa. He's a handsome fellow anyway. But he wouldn't keep his eye on the ball. I lost several of them there. Well, of course, he never saw a golf game before. He didn't know anything about it. There wasn't any need for water hazards down there in Africa on those golf courses. <laughs> the lions didn't go in for golf. They didn't seem to like it much. No, but the monkey ate it up. He did that. That was the end of the, of the golf game. Rosie and I never shoot unless we absolutely have to. We try our best to keep from shooting because you cannot shoot and make pictures at the same time. But sometimes we have to. During the time that we were down here in Tanganyika, we had to shoot three lions out of the 600 that we photographed. One day, Rosie was uh, fishing and she heard a growl behind her. She grabbed her gun and the top of the bank. And there was a lion lashing his tail and refusing to go away. And it looked dangerous for a little bit. Oh, I was so frightened this day. You notice how he does not want to go away. He perhaps wants to come down to drink. But I said to myself, if he comes a little bit closer, uh, he'll get it, you'll get it. Well, after five weeks with these fine boy scouts, we took the back trail to Nairobi. And then we placed the boys on the train and sent them back to America. Ozzie and I followed a few weeks later. We were sorry to see them go. And after a bench, that the boy scouts...